Hi everyone, welcome to Psychbytes. I'm Sunil Rigge, consultant psychiatrist. Psychbytes is your source of relevant and topical psychiatry and neuroscience news from around the world. In this edition of Psychbytes, we'll be looking at three key research studies. Firstly, we'll be looking at a potential biomarker for PTSD. Two, we'll be looking at the impact of the pandemic on the neurodevelopment of adolescent brains. And third, we'll be looking at the genes that influence human cognition. Starting off with our first bite, our first bite comes from Tufts University, Massachusetts, where researchers seem to have discovered a potential biomarker for post-traumatic stress disorder. Now we know that post-traumatic stress disorder is a debilitating condition that occurs after an individual witnesses or experiences a traumatic event. Now, while we know that post-traumatic stress disorder has some specific criteria, we also know that trauma of different forms can impact the brain in several biological ways. Now, what the researchers found was that heightened activation in a specific area of the brain, the amygdala, in response to seeing surprised and neutral facial expressions appears to be associated with developing PTSD. In this study, the team focused on male identical twin pairs and found that heightened activation in the amygdala in response to these facial expressions, particularly the surprised and neutral facial expressions, could be a biomarker for the risk of developing PTSD. PTSD following trauma. Dr. Hinojosa or Hinojosa, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly, the lead researcher explains that these findings suggest that individuals who have greater amygdala activation may be at risk of developing PTSD in the context of trauma. Now this of course could have implications in identifying people with this vulnerability because we can actually intervene at this early stage to potentially prevent and or treat post-traumatic stress disorder effectively. Now, the finding of amygdala activation is not a completely surprising finding because we know that amygdala plays a crucial role in stress and trauma response. But what's also really important is gender differences in the development of PTSD. Females have double the risk of developing PTSD compared to males. And we know from a biological perspective, female amygdalas are much more sensitive to stress and trauma than male amygdalas. And this this is linked to the corticotropin releasing factor, a hormone that's released from the hypothalamus and its impact on the amygdala, specifically the locus ceruleus. You see, what research tells us is that the corticotropin releasing factor that's released from the hypothalamus tends to activate the amygdala in females at a much higher intensity compared to males, which raises the risk of PTSD for females as well. Now, this takes us to an important recognition overall in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder because one, dysregulation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is an important feature of post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is linked to a number of physical illnesses, inflammatory conditions as well. And therefore, in females, we often see HP axis dysfunction in the form of polycystic ovarian syndrome, for example. And it's important for clinicians to recognize overall medical comorbidity in post-traumatic stress disorder. Secondly, I mentioned the word locus ceruleus. This is the home of the noradrenergic neurons. And what this tells us is that noradrenergic activation plays an important role in the pathogenesis of post-traumatic stress disorder. And therefore, in the overall treatment, this needs to be taken into account. Researchers also found that fear extinction, which plays an important part of the overall behavioral management in post-traumatic stress disorder, tends to have better outcomes when estradiol levels are high, as opposed to when endogenous estradiol levels are lower. So it does tell us the important role of hormones in the overall management of post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, of course, if you want to learn more about this, we have a two and a half hour interactive online course on post-traumatic stress disorder and it's coming out in April. So check it out on academy.psychscene.com. But back to the news. While this discovery is a significant step towards a deeper understanding of post-traumatic stress disorder and the role that the brain plays in its pathogenesis, we know that further research is often required with larger and more diverse samples. For example, gender differences. In this study, they looked at male identical twins, looking at a broader gender-based approach would be appropriate. And by better understanding the mechanisms behind post-traumatic stress disorder, we can work better towards prevention and 
treatment. For clinicians, for example, it's really important to recognize the heterogeneity, both from a psychological perspective and a medical perspective, because each individual with post-traumatic stress disorder tends to have a different constellation of symptoms. Recognizing the neurobiology, the psychological aspects, the different phenotypes plays an important role in the management overall. In conclusion, identifying a potential biomarker for post-traumatic stress disorder is, of course, great news. It's a significant step forward in understanding and the treatment of this condition and can potentially help us lead to earlier treatment, identifying vulnerable individuals, and may play an important role in the prevention of post-traumatic stress disorder. Our second bite takes us to an interesting study that looked at the effects of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, on mental health and brain maturation in adolescents and the implications moving forward. A number of studies have looked at the impact of the pandemic on psychological health in general. We know that the pandemic has led to a number of medical consequences, long-lasting conditions such as long COVID. Now, what this study found was that the brains of teenagers who lived through the pandemic may have undergone an accelerated maturation process, appearing about three years older than expected compared to young people prior to the pandemic. During adolescence, we know that the brain undergoes a natural maturation process, and this involves the thickening of the hippocampus, the amygdala, and what's called synaptic pruning, which means excess synapses are taken out and existing networks are strengthened, particularly in adolescence, what's called the frontal limbic connectivity, the frontal related to cognition, the limbic related to emotional regulation. This strengthening of connectivity becomes really important for later emotional regulation. The concept of emotional strength was first highlighted by Maslow, and we know emotional intelligence was something put forward by Goldman. And Goldman said that it doesn't matter how intelligent one is, to paraphrase, if one does not have their emotional capabilities in hand, it's very hard to go far in life. So the development of emotional regulation is an important part in the adolescent phase because it sets up the individual for later adulthood. What the study found is that the brains of the adolescents who experienced the pandemic appeared to have undergone this process at a faster rate than expected. Now this does not mean that this is negative because there are positives and negatives as we'll see in a bit. It's not clear though what factors of the pandemic might have contributed to this phenomenon. We know that while stress has been suggested as a potential cause, other aspects such as increased screen time due to homeschooling may have also played a role. The authors highlight that the impact of increased screen time is not well understood. On the one hand, this accelerated brain change may indicate increased maturity and resilience. On the other hand, it's possible that the negative impact of this may be found in the form of increased risk-taking or decreased impulse regulation or emotional regulation. Nonetheless, it's crucial that we ensure adequate support for children and adolescents as they go through different phases of life and particularly post-pandemic. Speaking of brain development, we'll be talking about the neurobiology of brain development quite a bit in the masterclass series on ADHD, particularly because ADHD is a neurodevelopmental condition. On day three of this masterclass, we look at the overlap between ADHD and ASD as well, both neurodevelopmental conditions. And this is where we delve deeper into the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, overall looking at the limbic system and the connection between the two, the frontal limbic connectivity and why adequate functioning of the frontal limbic system is so important and why dysfunction acts as a transdiagnostic marker. Of course, I'm getting ahead of myself as usual. So let's get back to our third bite, which makes us ask the question, have you ever Ever wondered why humans have such advanced cognitive abilities? Well, this research may provide some answers. According to this study published in the scientific journal Nature, advanced human cognition is attributed to increased neocortex size and complexity, even though the underlying evolutionary and regulatory mechanisms in the brain are largely unknown. So the neocortex is essentially the prefrontal cortex development, and that's what really separates us from animals. Now, whilst we know that the prefrontal cortex development has really led to 
advances in human cognition, which has translated into advancements overall in society. But at the same time, we know that prefrontal cortex development and perturbations in that development can increase the risk of a range of psychiatric disorders. So what this study did was to look at human and macaque embryonic neocortical data to identify approximately 4,000 enhancers in humans. Now, what these enhancers are, they're short sequences of DNA that help control gene activity. Now, what these enhancers do is that they activate the gene to a much higher intensity than would occur in their absence. So one can imagine that with an enhancer, whilst an higher intensity can result in positive effects, the opposite can also hold true. So what the researchers did was to use a deep learning model of enhancers to identify the gains which were found to be associated with de novo enhancers in the embryonic brain. So to simplify that, these enhancers led to an increased expression in progenitor cells and interneurons and were linked to critical neural developmental processes. Progenitor cells are biological cells that move on to differentiate into a specific cell type. So for example, a progenitor for a neuron will be a biological cell that will move on further to differentiate into a neuron, a specific kind of neuron. If you want to get a quick overview of genetics and epigenetics, then check out the article on the Site Scene Hub, where we provide an overview on genetics and epigenetics related to psychiatry and look at the implications of some of these epigenetic changes in psychiatric disorders. Coming back to the study, what's interesting is that essential mutations alter enhancer activity through changes in the binding of key transcription factors of the embryonic neocortex. Some of these genes are identified were ISL1, POU, 3F2, PIT, X12, and several SOX, SOX. But what we've got to recognize is that each of these plays an important part in neurodevelopment. The study's findings suggest that essential mutations lead to the gain of embryonic neocortex enhancers. Now, these enhancers then orchestrate the expression of genes involved in critical developmental processes associated with human cognition. Now, this is a significant breakthrough because it offers new insights into the mechanisms behind human cognition. And by better understanding these mechanisms, we can then explore new avenues for further research into the evolution of human brain. You're probably thinking at this point, well, what does this all mean? All these fancy numbers and letters, what does that actually mean for the future in psychiatry and neuroscience? For a start, what it tells us is that humans have advanced cognitive abilities compared to other primates because of these specific enhancers. The identification of these genes and enhancers is really fascinating because let's take the example of oncology whereby specific mutations are identified specific genetic mutations and then therapeutic targets are developed to target and combat that mutation and if we imagine a similar thing happening with regards to neurological neuropsychiatric issues that is a significant breakthrough therefore this may help us develop and identify certain therapies that target those specific genes or enhancers. So with that, we come to the end of this edition of Psychbytes. I hope that you found that useful and interesting. If you liked it, of course, leave us a like. Let me know, of course, what your thoughts are in the comment section below as well. And if you're a psychiatrist or a mental health professional, that's looking to transform your psychiatric practice, bringing in neurobiology, psychology, psychopharmacology, problem solving methodology with real life case studies, then don't forget to check out the Academy by Psychscene at academy.psychscene.com. I look forward to seeing you in another edition of Psych Bites soon. Until then, take care and stay curious. Bye-bye.